the next speaker is uh, Jose Marquez, and um, he's going to be talking about designing digital phantoms using a numerical approximation informed by in vivo scans. Hi, uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this very interesting session and on this very interesting conference. Uh, I'll be speaking about uh, slightly different kind of phantoms from the from the previous speaker. I'll be speaking about numerical phantoms and how can we try to make them slightly more realistic, looking uh, somewhat more like uh, a brain than just uh, piecewise constant uh, phantoms. So my I have no conflicts of interest regarding this presentation, and this copy uh, this presentation is released under the CCBI uh, license. So just uh, giving you a quick over overview of the presentation, I'll be speaking actually about the motivation for one specific phantom that we have created in the context of the QSM challenges. I'll be uh, going uh, on how we've created it and then how we can try to use the same kind of uh, process to create uh, new phantoms. Um, I will let you know where you can find it, how can you use it, and then uh, I'll share with you some of the lessons that we've learned in the process of, of trying to, to, to make this uh, open science uh, initiative of creating a phantom for everybody to use. So uh, often when we think about head uh, brain and head phantoms, we think about the Chef Logan phantom. It doesn't quite look like a brain, but uh, it is what we use uh, very often when you're doing image reconstruction pipelines or trying to, uh, to do any kind of, of numerical tests. Uh, yet the, this phantom is uh, in its more, most basic form a 2D, 2D numerical phantom. So it doesn't really kind of co cover all the aspects and the, the uh, complications of, of, of an actual brain. In terms of, of head models, there's, there's uh, various 3D head models which are based on multimodal segmentation. And this can be um, segmentation of uh, both uh, MRI and CT data. And, and you can find a, a lot of nice literature here on, on these two uh, references here. Um, it's interesting to, to note that there's a, most of the brain models are actually based on MRI, but uh, a lot of the head models come, come from uh, so, somewhat diverse literature and they, they come from TMS, EEG literature, where, where you don't care just about the, the brain, but also about the whole head. And they will normally involve um, having also uh, tissues outside the brain, such as head and skull and hair, uh, and hair, the, the one without an age. The, the problem with most of these um, of these uh, brain models is that they are not generative phantoms. So you 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 might have a, um, a phantom, but it might be uh, piecewise. It has one given contrast. It has one given value for everything. So in MRI, we often end up uh, trying to to use some kind of a ground truth. And often we we acquire a data set and we say, well, this is our ground truth. And then retrospectively, we try to um, do our own uh, our experiments to try to to see how, how close we are to this ground truth. Well, sadly, that's not always possible. And I wanted to tell you a bit of the story uh, of, of QSM. Um, so um, QSM is, uh, is uh, quantitative susceptibility mapping. And it is based on the following idea. Um, MRI is a, a, a able to measure um, the magnetic field perturbations. So it can me measure basically uh, whether you have a place with a high magnetic field or with a low magnetic field. But what you'd actually would like to know is not so much what is a magnetic field perturbation, but what is the shape of the magnet that is creating this magnetic field perturbation. And you know uh, from an from a electromagnetist perspective how this is built. You know that the, the, the magnetic field perturbation that you've measured is nothing more than a, a convolution of a dipole uh, kernel. Uh, or convoluted with the distribution of magnetic properties. So in QSM, uh, what you try to do is to find out what is the distribution of magnetic stability that is able to generate uh, this field perturbation. Well, uh, this is easier uh, said than done, but this is essentially a deconvolution problem and a deconvolution problem that is very ill-posed. So there's millions of options of chi's that can generate exactly the same uh, magnetic field perturbation. And so there's uh, plenty of methods uh, uh, coming out in literature, coming every, not so much every month anymore, but probably at least every two, three months, there's a new method saying we've, we've achieved the best method out there to, to perform QSM. And they will be, be basically using, uh, trying to do some kind of data fidelity matching in terms of trying to find a chi that is able to, find, to fit the B, using some kind of prior uh, in the form of regularization or some other form. So the one question that we always uh, pose ourselves is, what is the best deconvolution method? And that's why you, we've organized in the past um, 
quantitative suitability mapping uh, reconstruction challenges, where we try to give people a ground truth and, and let them uh, try to decide. Well, uh, maybe one step back um, is that a lot of times we try to test this uh, question on piecewise constant models, like the ones that we showed on, on the previous slide. Now, if you use piecewise constant models, uh, you know that a piecewise constant prior will always be the best prior that you can have for a piecewise constant model. So you need to have something more complex. And one way is to try to use a ground truth. So use actual data um, using some kind of reference method as our, our previous speaker was speaking, uh, was mentioning, um, to, to use as a reference. And that's what was on, on, the, on this reconstruction challenge in 2016. And it was actually uh, quite surprising because Sometimes you think that your reference method is, is giving you the correct ground truth, but it might not be the correct ground truth. It might be actually slightly incorrect. And what it results is that uh, the, you might have a challenge that tries to discover what is the best value based on some kind of RMSC metric, but you might get always results which are really not uh, results that you'd be proud. But these three uh, submissions were the, were the reconstruction um, approaches that gave us the best metrics. But uh, yet any person looking at them will say, well, these look extremely plastic and unlikely to be uh, images of the brain. So how could we uh, try to fix this? Uh, we tried to create a new challenge. We called it QSM challenge 2.0. And we tried to, to, to control a bit more uh, what was happening in the process. So we tried to use uh, a, head, a numerical head phantom or a digital phantom. But we don't, we don't want to just have a, a digital problem. We also wanted to have it combined with an MRI simulator and an MRI simulator where we can control all the physics. And why did we want to have these two things coupled? Uh, because we thought, well, we can, we can think of, uh, we can, in some situations you might have a good algorithm, but the, what a good algorithm is, depends a lot on the data available. Uh, and so it depends on what kind of resolution you have, how much noise you have, and how much image contrast you have. So it's very important to, to have a, a phantom that can be can generate data at different uh, spatial resolutions, at different noise conditions, also at even different image contrast uh, uh, environments. And also, uh, a good algorithm depends in a lot in the application. What do you want to do with the, with the data that you get from your... From your uh, in this case, a QSM map. Do you want to measure um, uh, oxygenation in, in blood vessels, which are very small and thin? Or do you want to measure the, the position in large deep gray matter regions? Or do you want to have something which looks good over the entire brain? So the, the metrics that you should use should be really kind of application uh, driven. And just measuring RMSC over the whole brain uh, is not giving you a, a good picture of, of the problem. So this was, uh, although I'm presenting here, this was really a, a teamwork by, a, by a, a large organization committee that had uh, people from a, a lot of, of institutions. Uh, and I'll be presenting essentially the work that, that's uh, on these two papers. And this was a, a, a very nice teamwork. And I think we're probably the first people that ever uh, published with the first offer, which is an organization committee. Uh, this is uh, our first uh, offers paper. So uh, how did we uh, try to create this phantom? Well, uh, quantitative imaging is actually a great uh, um, playground to create generative models. And so what we, we use, we use a, a sequence that we had developed some years ago, which is the mp 2 rage me sequence. And uh, it allows us to compute uh, at the same time uh, M0 maps, R1 maps, R2 star maps, and chi maps. And these are essentially the, the, the uh, four quantitative maps that you'd need to, to generate um, images at any given TR, TE, and so on. Keep in mind that the, obviously we don't trust this guy uh, very much, but it, it's, it's good that we could compute some kind of approximation. Uh, after that, we, 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 we gave our R1 map data to some kind of atlas and T1 uh, brain-based segmentation. We segmented all sort, sorts of nuclei. We went to our R2 star map. We, we, we obtained um, all sorts of um, vein uh, masks uh, over, over the brain. We went to our QSM to be able to delineate very carefully uh, most of the deep gray matter uh, structures. And then we also uh, came to, our, to the 3T system where we acquired uh, some uh, ultra short echo time so that we can try to segment uh, not only the, 
and the tissues, but also see where, where bone marrow is and where, where do we have actually air interfaces so that we could create an air bone tissue uh, brain mass. And with these, we were able to get a, like a combined segmentation of all these tissues uh, that we could use for uh, future simulations. And on the top, and I'll show you why we did this, we also acquired some uh, high resolution uh, uh, diffusion imaging so that we could add X-ray effects into our, our data. Uh, this was done uh, at two stages that the acquisition was performing in, in Amsterdam uh, with our colleagues from the Spinoza. And then we had a, somewhat of an Akatron where we, we met in Nijmegen and in the old days when we, when we could meet uh, physically somewhere. And we uh, spent two days trying to get the segmentation right and, uh, and, uh, and the simulations right. So how do we go now from the fact that we had a segmented brain to have a realistic susceptibility model that we can use uh, as our ground truth. The way we tried to do it was, was the following. So the, the traditional way is that you, you, you pick your segmentation model, you go to literature and you say, well, each tissue will have just a very constant uh, magnetic susceptibility. And, but this is a, a piecewise constant model and, we, and that's not what we want. So what we tried to do was to, to uh, build on the fact that we had also uh, quantitative maps of relaxation properties. So we had ma maps for uh, uh, at every pixel of, of the T2 star relaxivity and the star, uh, uh, sorry, R1 relaxivity. And we tried to, uh, for each tissue, create a different spatial modulation so that uh, we could generate some kind of realistic variations within each, uh, within each, um, each uh, uh, tissue uh, region. And then to make sure that we could introduce some partial volumes, we, we introduce, introduce kind of probabilistic smoothing that allows us to have, the, uh, for example, our veins not being so uh, uh, piecewise constant, but to, to account for the fact that they are small and that they get interpolated. And, we, and because we're not sure uh, what, what uh, we don't want to get uh, uh, one ground truth that was better than all the, all the others, we actually created two ground truths. One where we used literature values uh, for everything, and we added a small classification in the middle of the brain uh, to make uh, life difficult for our participants. And another one where we tried to make the contrast between tissues smaller, and, uh, but increase the modulation within uh, each tissue sample. So how, how can you now, um, if you wanted to create more ground truths, how, how can you um, do these? Well, it's, it's quite simple. You, in, in this case, uh, on our data sharing collection, you get a file where you have, the relax, uh, you have to have the, your relaxation maps, your segmented model. You have to define some uh, trust regions because your R2 star maps are not always good uh, in some regions. You have to de define a, a modulation that you want to introduce per uh, segmented tissue. So how much modulation of uh, based on R1 or R2 star you want to introduce uh, in white matter and in gray matter and in other regions, you can introduce more or less random values within each um, which tissue. And then you run and you, you, you have your uh, new model. Uh, so you have, you have new models, uh, and what can you do to them? Well, you can uh, add them to some kind of physics. You, you can now start generating complex data, so some GRE signal. And the GRE signal, uh, we all know uh, more or less how, how it can be computed. It has this kind of steady state equation. And if you look at it, well, most of these are sequence parameters that you, that you can decide uh, if you're trying to generate data that corresponds to a given acquisition, you have to define your flip angles, your repetition times, your echo times, and then you, you, you have to give it some model parameters like the M0 maps that we, had, that we had measured on our numerical phantom, the R2 star maps, the R1 map, and the susceptibility. And we, we can add some other um, artifacts to it, like well, we, we can uh, then compute how will, be the, the, how will be the phase at a given echo time? And uh, we can add some uh, uh, phase offsets that can be due to, for example, to uh, B1 uh, transmitting homogeneity or B1 receiving homogeneity. So this is what, uh, what, uh, how you, we generate real data. In practice, uh, again, code-wise, it's, it's pretty simple. You, you, uh, we, we, we release these... Um, uh, the, the model, which has an R1, an R2 star, an M0 map, and the segmentation model, and the, and the susceptibility model. You, you introduce them. You say what kind of sequence you're simulating, in what kind of environment you want to simulate. Do you want to simulate it at 70? Do you want the head to be uh, oriented along the magnetic field or in some kind of other direction? Do you want to create some phase offset because of B1 in homogeneity? Do you want to uh, add some extra shimming that you might uh, be doing anyway? 
And also very importantly, what kind of resolution do you want your simulations to be performed at? Um, and this is interesting because it allows you to start simulating more complex features, uh, which you don't simulate when you're just doing the your forward uh, physics model, but that you, you're, for example, simulating full slice defacing and, and uh, such effects. And then you can uh, simulate data. And what, what, uh, what's very interesting from, uh, from an, of using a numerical phantom in the, in the context of QSM is that you can actually uh, decide to turn off and on, on and off the, the background fields. So you, you can create um, images where you don't have any susceptibility on the outside the brain mask. So out, you don't have uh, skull, you don't have air, you, everything is, uh, your, your brain is just nicely positioned in a, in a big bath of water. Or you can have something more realistic. And this allows us to then test the different uh, steps of, for example, uh, QSM processing or of a background field removal process. So how do we share our data? Um, we, we, we shared our, our data in, in various forms. I'm, I'm showing you just the part where we, uh, how we shared our uh, phantom in a, in, a, in a data repository. It's, it's, a, it's probably the worst day to, share, to show this slide because please don't take a picture of this QR code because of this Java crisis that uh, you might have seen on the news. We had to, to put, pull down the, our data sharing collection uh, for a couple of days uh, for safety purposes, but it should be online uh, again uh, very soon. But what a data sharing collection has, uh, has uh, is all the data, something telling you uh, what is the structure uh, of, of, uh, of these data sharing collection. It has a license because we're not just sharing some numerical values. We're actually sh sharing data of a subject that has a face and is recognizable. So you, you have to uh, agree not to, to try to recognize the person, for example. Um, and then you have uh, lots of scripts that allow you to generate new susceptibility phantoms, uh, modify the susceptibility phantom, create new data, or simply reproduce the various uh, steps of the paper. Um, and, and other than uh, providing this idea that uh, we can uh, generate data, it's also very, very important to, fi to find out what kind of metrics you can use. So there's various uh, types of metrics. We have uh, RMSC or structural similarity or high frequency um, uh, components of the image, but we also looked into things like regional MSC. So how is the, how good is their MSC in our tissue uh, areas, or how how big how good is our MSC in blood areas, or in deep gray matter structures, or some more QSM specific uh, 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 features like what is the the slope precision of my uh, QSM, or how much streaking does it have? Can I ca compute the um, a good moment for my classification? And very importantly, when you're doing things that are supposed to be realistic, is actually to have some kind of visual rating. Uh, how uh, and, and we had to, to come up with very uh, unnatural names for these. So one, one of them is uh, how much trick does it have uh, when you look at it visually? Does it compare well to our numerical approach of, of computing streaking? How natural does the image look? Uh, how much uh, do we have a perception that is very noisy or does it seem like it has a natural amount of noise. And where, where do the differences actually uh, uh, visually, where, where do we think that things have become different? And what was interesting to find out is that uh, indeed some RMSC metrics are quite heavily correlated. And actually the, our, the, 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 the perception of having a natural image is pretty uh, well correlated with RMSC. So that's actually a, a, a good thing. So RMSC is not completely lost as a, as, as a metric uh, um, for everything. Um, and we also uh, also uh, were able to to show that another um, our streaking metric uh, actually was the, the the one that correlated best with the visual perception of streaking. So it means that now we, you can go and use use our MSC metrics and and streaking metrics, and these are actually good metrics. Uh, they, they represent well what what you'd uh, have, would have rated visually. Another interesting feature um, of this is to to start looking at the data and and the algorithms how they they performed in this context. So for example, here we have a plot of, of our MSC and we have uh, different kind of methods. We have iterative methods, uh, direct methods and uh, deep learning methods. And what we can see is that uh, for our great surprise in a time where, um, where uh, everything seems to be deep learning, uh, our iterative methods based on, on uh, uh, some kind of regularization were still our, our best metrics in terms of, of our MSC. 
although the deep learning methods did uh, perform significantly better in the context of visual writing, but still not quite at the level of, of the iterative methods that are actually trying to solve the physical process uh, uh, in a, let's say, in a hardcore way. Uh, and so what, what, what can we do more with this, with this data? Um, what, one of them uh, is to try to see, well, is, is, is our data really realistic? So this is a, a picture of our acquired data. This is a picture of our simulated data. And you can see they have similar kind of uh, quality and, and, and noise levels. This is our face data. It also looks similar. Maybe we, we didn't quite tune our, um, our background fields to be quite as strong as in real life. But our phase, uh, our tissue frequency is also quite of, uh, comparable, but somewhat you, you seem to have here less variance than, than you have on the, on the real data. But we had also uh, computed other things. We had, uh, as I, uh, and this is, this is the kind of model where the QSM physics holds. So th this is perfect data to apply QSM. But in practice, in real life, we know there's more than just real, uh, the, than the QSM physics. We know that um, phase is, is perturbed with what we call microstructural effects and that we could uh, simulate using the DTI data. And if we add this DTI data to our phase, we can actually now start getting phase data that looks a lot more like, uh, like our, our actually acquired data. So that means that we can, we're also providing data where people can uh, estimate the biases of the QSM methods because the QSM physics doesn't actually hold true everywhere. So uh, just to wrap up my, my presentation, um, we, we've delivered a, a realistic head phantom, which has 16 tissue classes based on uh, essentially quantitative imaging, M0, R1, and R2, R2 star, from which you can also compute an, a, a chi map, which is somewhat realistic, at least, or, or, or as, as realistic as we could think of. And this provides really a framework to test uh, limitations of, of different protocols and QSM pipelines. So it allows you to test, uh, uh, is, it a good, uh, is my pipeline good for high or low spatial resolution data or what kind of resolution do I need to be able to see what I'm, what I'm trying to see in my project? Should I be acquiring single or multi-echo? This is something that you can test easily on, on this kind of data. Uh, evaluate phase and wrapping in regions of complicated, uh, uh, of, of signal dropout. Evaluate background field removal, which is probably uh, will be the third challenge. And then also see what, what's the impact of, of microstructure and shimming in, in QSM quantification. And we also have basically a platform where you can start adding new kind of uh, uh, artifacts or lesions or, or something like this. It could also be used for like distortion correction uh, or to test uh, uh, different sequence readouts to, to this uh, sensitivity to distortion and to distortion correction or to, to study full slicey phasing. It can sadly be used for flow imaging or spin echo simulations or fingerprinting like things because we don't actually yeah, have R2, R2 maps. But I think this framework could be uh, applied to new data where, where you do have this, this information to, to use it widely. So uh, a couple of, of, of lessons learned in the, in the process. Is it realistic enough? Uh, well, I'm not sure. So this is probably not a, a, a true lesson learned, but we, I think we, we, we might, we, we could probably have, have done uh, better. But we surely contribute to reproducibility when I start seeing how many people have downloaded both the, the, the phantom uh, data and, and also the, the challenge data, which means that uh, people are now developing methods and they can, they can actually uh, see how well they are doing to the, towards, uh, in comparison to the state of art that was performed on, on the same uh, data. Uh, one thing that I would recommend, and uh, which probably I didn't did, uh, didn't, haven't done uh, in the process, to start thinking about sharing from the start of the project. This means, uh, uh, how do you start anonymizing your data at the start, defacing or not? Uh, what are the, the implications of not defacing the data? Um, and how, uh, what is it that will be uh, on your final collection that you, that you will share? Uh, and uh, as a last thing, I'd say that sharing data and code really adds value to your research uh, and, and adds value also to your time because every, having uh, what you've done somewhere nicely organized, even if, especially if you're a disorganized person like me, uh, it will help you a lot in the future to, to be able to, to give a nice package uh, back to, the, to your colleagues. And with these, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, happy to receive some questions. Thank you, Jose. That was very 
a uh, very nice talk. And um, I think the advice at the end there was also very good advice. Um, certainly could take that myself.